Uh, all right, so as I was introduced, my name is Maeve Bassett. I am the Conservation Program Specialist at the San Antonio Botanical Garden. Um, and as my many duties were read off, I started to feel extra tired. Uh, but don't worry, I got some sweet tea, so <laughs> I should be able to get through this one. But um, my specialty is kind of weird, and I always have to go into this with whomever I'm talking to, just so you can kind of figure out how my brain works. And as I've been told in many of my classes, kind of that background into how my brain works helps follow along with my classes. So I like, I like to do that little bit of introduction. And um, let me, how do I go to the next slide? Ha, okay. So my specialty is what's called applied ethnobotany. So I, ethnobotany is, all right, that's covering it up. It's all right, I can read. Ethnobotany is the study of the relationship between people and plants. And because it's based in anthropology, most people initially think it's how indigenous people use plants for medicine and ritual. And it's extinct, it's in history, it's, it's over. And that's, that's, I do look at that stuff and that is very interesting to me. But I'm more so interested in your chemical dependency on coffee every morning or how you've never been able to eat Brussels sprouts because your grandma used to boil them and make your entire house smell like farts. <laughs> All of that's ethnobotany. And you can look at that and you can go back to the 50s and the 60s and women going into the workforce and the rise in refrigeration and freezer technology. And it's all connected in some way. And I like this picture on the top left because I was born in Utah and uh, we are known for green jello. My grandpa had three different jello recipes at his funeral. And so I just like to look at these weird food trends, uh, weird food ideas. Uh, the middle one's a lemon stick from Baltimore, which was hands easily so much better than crabs. I love crabs, but this was like the top tier pinnacle of Baltimore food is you take a peppermint stick, you jam it in a lemon, and then you suck the lemon juice up through the peppermint and it's amazing. It's spectacular. And so those are the kinds of things I look at. Now, somebody else joined. So I work at the San Antonio Botanical Garden. And for those of you that have not yet made it up there, hopefully you can go next month. But I wanted to do a little bit of introductory just to show you what I have to work with. So we have five areas in the garden that particularly focus on native plants. We have Water Saver Garden. We have Water Saver Lane, which was a 15 year old exhibit that is currently being redone it was originally designed to only last two years and it was so popular, they kind of just left it there and it slowly overgrew itself. And it was looking very sad. Um, it is going to look very, very cool. I've been helping with the schematics. So hopefully you can check it out when it's rebuilt. But we also have three native trails. We have a hill country, an East Texas piney woods and a South Texas trail. And so with my job at the San Antonio Botanical Garden, my focus is on native plants. And part of that is deliverable requirements. I was hired as the conservation specialist, so I focus on conservation. But I also particularly love native plants because they are a lot less appreciated. And in Texas, they are really not appreciated. Um, you actively despise some Texas natives. And so my goal is to kind of get people to look at these Texas natives a little bit differently. And maybe if you don't appreciate them, at least you can kind of just be like, all right, you're not the worst thing in the entire world, uh, Hackberry. So when it comes to ethnobotany there's a lot of things i can talk about and a lot of the foods that we eat come from native plants originally and so that's one of the easiest ways to talk about them and in particular i want to talk about one an example and this is sorry the program kind of screwed up my presentation if it looks a little wonky um the i want to consider the wheat tortilla so when people 
Um, originally, corn was the primary grain. Uh, we'll get into mesquite a little bit later if anybody's like, hey, you forgot about the other primary food source. But corn was the primary grain of uh, meal carbohydrate source when the Spanish arrived. However, they promoted wheat as the pure Castilian food over the heathen corn. Their words, not mine. However, at that time, they had not yet built mills. And so you had these women that were grinding wheat on mano a matate. And when you do it like that, you can't really get it fine enough or it takes too much work to get it fine enough to make bread. So what do you do? You fry it into a tortilla. And so my, one of my senior theses at University of Maryland was looking at Tex-Mex and how Tex-Mex came to be and all the different relationships throughout time and how they created this food that is both loved and um, made fun of quite a bit in certain ways. So this is just one very small example of that. And this is just another example of how I can go about talking about a native plant is there are so many different ways to connect people. And you guys are often not the target audience that I am usually working with because you guys love native plants. You are in a society, you're spending time on a Monday evening with each other. I am often working with the people that, especially in San Antonio, largely transient military population. They've never grown plants in Texas. Uh, I don't have a backyard, I have a patio. And so if you're not saving water by planting these plants, if you aren't particularly interested in butterflies, how do you get people interested in native plants besides being like, they're helpful. Um, that's fantastic, but I aim to go a bit be up, above and beyond that. So for this presentation, I've kind of split them up into three different categories. I've got three plants for each of these. I have the despised, the forgotten, and the tasty. And so I'm gonna talk about these different plant, native plants, how they've been utilized throughout history, how they're utilized today, and maybe tell you a cool, fun few facts about them. Now I know it said medicinal plants on my thing. I will talk about that, I promise, but I will use my caveat that I give on all my tours. One, don't take my weird and obscure facts as medical advice. Uh, two, often a lot of these native plants were used by so many people that one plant can have a list this long of medicinal uses. But the way I like to sum this up is number three, four plants at the San Antonio Botanical Garden were at one point named anti-syphiletica. Wishful thinking does not a medicine make. So I try to aim specifically for things that I have peer reviewed research on and I'll talk about that. Um, and so I just like to give that caveat because people are always asking for that and I wish I could do it more. All right, I said despised. So we have to start with easily one of the most despised plants in all of Texas. This is the ash juniper, also known as the mountain cedar. It's not a cedar, it doesn't grow in the mountains. Uh, it was named that because the early European explorers thought it looked very similar to old world cedar trees. Now, this is one of the trees that I like to use as an example for devils of our own making. This is a good plant to talk about when you're talking about conservation and land management, because this tree was never this prevalent. It was really when the early European settlers came in and their aggressive agricultural techniques that stripped a lot of the hill country of the topsoil. And what survives is ash juniper. It's resilient, it can survive pretty much anywhere. And so it did, it didn't have all these grasses to compete with and so it just, it just went nuts. And unlike something like poison ivy or poison oak, which has a ritual, uh, which is the toxin that we're allergic to, we're not actually that allergic to ash juniper. Um, before you all get after me, it's the overwhelming quantity of it in the air that actually causes a histemic response and cedar fever. 
So it's the fact that there's so much in the air that our bodies just kind of go like, I don't know what's going on. I'm dying. There's some kind of thing in the air and I don't know what to do with it. So I'm going to make you cough. I'm going to make you sniffle. I'm going to give you a migraine, all those different things. And so it's your body just completely not being able to respond to it. Um, I know I'm never going to really be able to get people to appreciate this tree and, but it's, you can make gin out of it. It is a juniper, <laughs> so it gets the cones, it gets the berries, and they juniper has been used for thousands and thousands and thousands of years for its medicinal properties. That's where gin came about. Throughout most of history, alcohol has tasted absolutely horrendous. And so when something tastes bad, you add things that taste good, oops, sorry, taste good to it, and it helps even more if that thing happens to be medicinal and might help you. And that's where you get gin and mulled wines. So you can do that. You can also make vinaigrette. It is a, um, it is a pine. You're gonna get that pine flavor. So if you wanna add vinaigrette, uh, pine flavor to a vinaigrette, to an alcohol, anything like that, you can incorporate that a little bit. <clears throat> so it's for you. Um, <laughs> so mesquite, mesquite has become one of my favorite plants since I moved to this area. And it was a while before I realized that they were called devil trees. And I started to, that kind of got me going down a rabbit hole of why is this amazing, super unique tree called a devil tree? And there's a lot of reasons. The thorns uh, it has mutualistic relationships with ants where it'll feed the ants and then the ants will go out and attack anything that uh, might harm or shade out the tree, including a a wayward logger or a cow even. And so you have to be very careful with them. But they also have super deep tap roots. So they can be a huge pain to pull out, especially if you're trying to get a lot of open pasture land to raise cattle on. But they are uniquely important for this area, especially going south into the Rio Grande Valley. You can have a mesquite bean rolling around kind of in the middle of nowhere and it can hit a spot. And if it manages to sprout, it'll create that long, long, long tap root that will go all the way down and will find water that essentially no other plant can get. Uh, it'll also grow up, it'll create shade, it'll drop leaves, which will add nutrients to the soil. It will, um, that's where water will collect. It'll shade areas, so it'll cool them. And it'll also, it is a legum leguminous tree, so it'll take uh, nitrogen from the air that plants can't use and convert it into nitrogen that other plants can use. So you'll see these mesquites that are essentially oases and they've, they've done it all themselves. And that's, they're pretty much the only nitrogen fixer in, whoops, in uh, the Rio Grande Valley. And so they're the reason that it, life exists down there. They also have the pods that are incredibly nutritious, incredibly delicious and are starting to get revitalized as a great nutrition source, especially as people are looking for gluten-free options. It has, um, especially these honey mesquites, uh, have high sugar content, have uh, complex carbohydrates. And if you've ever had it, it tastes like chocolatey hazelnut. Um, it's absolutely delicious. I just mix it with butter and then I spread it on toast. It's so simple, but it's so delicious. And every time I give people that in classes, they're just like, it's, it's just mesquite and butter. It's like, yep, that's it. That's all you need. And just for a little bit of funny history, but San Antonio in the 1880s had the absolutely fantastic idea to use mesquite as uh, paneling for their streets. Now there were two problems with this and they only did it for two years. Honestly, I'm amazed it lasted one. But as being wood, it swells when it rains, which is like, okay, that's not a huge deal because as we can see now, it doesn't rain that much. The bigger problem was San Antonio and Texas residents are notoriously bad at dealing with cold. And so if you step out your front door and there's all this beautiful, nice wood to burn uh, to keep you warm, why would you go down the street to buy it? And so every winter, all the San Antonio residents were going up and ripping up all these 
wooden mesquite cobblestones. And so they stop that very, very quickly. This is getting revitalized. There's a lot of research. Go to Hayden if you have more questions about it, but they're doing research into crossbreeding ones that grow straight um, and thornless. And so if it's straight, it's better for the lumber industry. So maybe as they become a little bit more useful, they get, might get a little bit more love, but definitely try mesquite stuff if you can. Oh yeah, <laughs> I, I'm in Texas. So I figure I don't need to talk about <laughs> the smoking and the wood burning, <laughs> but the chili queens, they specifically said in their recipes that they would make their chili con carne at home and then bring it to Military Plaza and it had to be reheated over a mesquite wood fire. In all of my archival research, people are never that specific about the wood. So it's kind of cool. And my last of the despised plants is of course the hackberry. Now this one, I know I don't really have to defend all that much. It's not like it's going extinct. Uh, if you have one tree, you usually have about 700 seedlings. So I don't have to worry too much about stopping people from ripping these out, uh, but it's an absolutely fantastic tree. And a lot of people don't like it because it's very adapted for the hill country. So unlike the mesquite that goes down, its roots go out. And so when it gets about five to seven years old, those roots just can't handle it anymore. And it takes out your fence, your car, your family pet, uh, whatever gets in its way when it falls down. But the most spectacular thing about this is those little berries. And you guys have probably seen them. They're tiny. They're absolutely super, super small. Those are incredibly nutritious and filled with fat. And in the plant world, fat is very, very hard to come by. You have avocados, you have nuts, but otherwise you don't have a lot. And so for that's why birds and every single little critter will just take every single one off the tree and then land on your fence and poop out all the seedlings. So you get 700 new seedlings the next year. But they're doing it to get that fat to either survive the absolutely terrible, harsh winters of San Antonio or make that migration to warmer lands. For humans, that fat has also been super important. You have records of indigenous people. They would take this, they would grind it up, make it into balls, put it on a stick, and then they would roast it over a fire. Uh, they would also make what are called turtles, where you take the fat, you dry it out, and then you could break off pieces whenever you needed it. And fat's very important. Um, if you're not great at hunting, you got to find some kind of fat besides uh, that rabbit or that deer. So this was very important, especially in the lean years. And the last mind-blowing fact about this tree is there has been some initial research that the human species went through seven ice ages. The areas where humans continued to survive, every single one of them, there's a hackberry species. So we're not alive today because of this plant, but you can kind of say that. And if you really want to be a dramatic on a tour or presentation, you can. So just explain it. But so this is a really cool tree. Uh, lastly, the name hackberry comes from the Scottish hagberry, naming it after a tree that looks very similar. So the way I always remind people to remember it is hag uh, folklore is uh, witches, witches have warts, warty bark. And that's always the way I can get people to remember this tree. Do any, does anyone have any questions really quickly before I move on to the forgotten? Yeah. What part of the um, mesquite do you use for butter? Uh, so I use the entire pod. So the, uh, the flesh of the pod has the sugar content in it, but the complex carbohydrates and protein are in the seeds as well. So if you have a really good blender, and I'm actually trying to make it myself this year, <laughs> um, I've been harvesting them from the garden, but um, I can, you can also just buy mesquite flour, use the entire thing. Um, and so all of it. All right, I'm gonna talk about the forgotten. Now, besides mesquite, this is my other favorite plant to talk about. <laughs> Yaupon holly or Elix vomitoria. And I promise I will get to that name eventually, but 
This is the only plant native to North America that contains a significant amount of caffeine. It has about a, the same amount of caffeine as Camellia sinensis plant from Asia, which is uh, green tea, black tea, all the teas that you know. It was used pretty much by every indigenous person that lived where it grew. Humans love caffeine. And so they readily incorporated it into their diets, their rituals. And this is where some of the misunderstanding comes from, is you have these stories of these Spanish missionaries arriving in the American Southwest or South and seeing and recording these um, uh, purging ceremonies. So the idea was before a ceremony, before a ritual, you'd get anything impure out of your body, no matter which end it came out of you, you're just getting it out. <laughs> and so the early missionaries wrote down that this drink that they were drinking, that's clearly what that was causing it. And it's led to this idea. I still have people on my tours being like, oh yeah, I was told by my mom that makes you vomit. If you eat enough of those berries, sure, it's going to be a rough day. But the leaves are safe, I promise. I drink it a lot. So this was a huge export to Europe for a long time. It was called Appalachian. It was called Indian chocolate. It was very, very popular in Europe until you had Camellia sinensis coming in and, and Europe kind of switched over to that. And then when uh, Americans threw all that fancy British tea over the ship, they went, oh no. We're trying to build a new country. We need some caffeine. That takes a lot of work. And so they rebranded this plant as Liberty Tea and sold it for a long time. And then it kind of fell out of favor with the rise of plantations where you have this rising middle class and they want that fancy stuff from Europe again. So this is a fantastic a plant to play with. It has caffeine, it has a lot of the same benefits that Camellia sinensis is going to be having. So what you can do is you can harvest the leaves and then you can roast them to different levels. If you like a black tea, roast it really dark and you'll get a black tea. If you like green tea, just dehydrate it and then you'll get a green tea flavor or anywhere in between. However, remember, heat degrades caffeine. So the more you roast it, just like a dark roast coffee has less caffeine than a light roast coffee, um, you'll, you'll be degrading that caffeine, caffeine so you won't get as much benefit from it. So, but there's, this is becoming really, really popular as well. And you can find it even in some grocery stores around here, which is pretty cool. All right, I promised I'd get back to the name and this is my favorite part. And I never miss mentioning this because I will write this wrong every, native plant society at a time. But there was a man named William Ayton at the Kew Botanical Garden. So he was a botanist for the queen. And this plant was originally named Elix Cassina by Linnaeus. So William Ayton was a very good friend of the East India Trading Company. And that was the company that was bringing in Camellia sinensis from Asia, the direct competitor of Yaupon Holly. So he is the one who renamed it Elix Vomitoria, supposedly using these stories of these Spanish missionaries. But in reality, he was just making it really unappealing and it, people lost interest in it. It worked. It was a great marketing scheme. Um, and so I, I just aim to write that wrong. It does not make you vomit. It's absolutely delicious. It's a little bit nuttier, a little bit earthier. It does taste different, but because if you like that more tannicky bitterness of like a black tea, you'll get that if you roast it a little bit more. If you like the bright greenness of a green tea, you can kind of duplicate those flavors, but um, it is gonna taste a little bit different and a little bit unique. It also blends really well too. Uh, there's a company called Yaya that's starting to blend it with like rose hips and petals and lavender and stuff like that too. So just like a regular tea, you can mix it with whatever you want. So Texas mountain laurel. This is, I did not know that grape could be a natural flavor or natural scent until I moved to Texas and I encountered this tree for the first time. Uh, 
most people know this one, and I'm not going to go too much into it as a specific plant because a lot of you are native plant experts. So it creates these beautiful, beautiful red seeds and more modern day ethnobotany is whenever I stop at this one, I can always tell the native Texas person because they'll start rubbing their arms as soon as they see this tree. Uh, they experienced it as what's called burn bean, where you take that incredibly, incredibly hard shell and you rub it up against the cement and then you lean over and you burn your sibling with it. Um, so many people have been traumatized by this tree. It is incredibly toxic, but because of that very, very, very hard shell, it'll just pass right through you as long as it's not cracked. It'll pass through your dog. It'll pass through your small, not very smart child. Um, any of those things, it'll just go right through as long as it's cracked, uh, it's not cracked. And, but that incredibly toxic material inside of them has been used for thousands and thousands of years. This is the precursor to peyote. So when it comes to medicines, hallucinogens, toxins, there's a very, very thin line between interesting hallucinations and death. And with this one, the line is very, very, very thin. So it was used for a very long time by indigenous peoples for uh, rituals and they have records of running over coals and euphoria. But over time, as peyote was discovered, and utilized more, this one fell out of favor. However, you can still see in peyote ceremonies, they'll be wearing this Texas mountain laurel in their adornments um, in response to those times before. It also has the name Big Drunk Bean because apparently there was a time in the wild, wild west of Texas where you could take a little bit of this plant, the seed, sprinkle it in your tequila, uh, hit it back and you would have really fun hallucinations and then fall asleep for three days. So <laughs> big drunk bean is a very accurate plant, but nowadays it's mostly used as a native plant that people love for the beautiful wisteria like blossoms, but it's still used by a lot of indigenous people for adornments. So that is a necklace that a Yanaguan uh, person made for me for my exhibit and it's a uh, striped agate with mountain laurel as well. So really beautiful and a really cool way to, to use a native plant for adornments. Mm -hmm. Yes. Are the, are, are the leaves toxic too? Uh, yes, they are. Yeah, pretty much all of the plant is toxic, but usually what I say is if you're stuck in the middle of nowhere, plants usually don't want you to eat their babies and they don't want you to eat their roots because anything else you it can usually come back from. And so as a very general rule, toxins are usually accumulated most in the roots and the uh, seeds and the least in the flowers because flowers are incredibly temporary. They're already putting a lot of energy into making this flower to creating the nectar. And so it's extra energy for them to then put toxins into the flower too. So if you, yes. Sure. Yeah. So yeah, there's a, so being in San Antonio, we have a store called Central Market. That's, it's like the Whole Foods of uh, HEB. Do you guys have yeah. yeah. Uh, so they have one. There's uh, Yaya is the one that's doing the blending. And they have one that's Yao Pan plus rose. They have one that's um, Yao Pan plus like chamomile. But then you also have Cat Springs Yao Pan and they're roasting it at the different levels. So if you don't want to bother harvesting it um, and roasting it and doing all that yourself, no problem. There are small local companies that are doing that too, you can support. Okay, the last of the forgotten ones that I want to talk about is sukul. Now, when it comes to ethnobotany, so a few of you were talking with me before, and I talk a lot about alcohol um, in a lot of my programs. And that's because as a general ethnobotany rule, if something has sugars and or starches in it, people will ferment it at some point in history. <laughs> so, and alcohol was a 
it was required. Uh, for most of history, water has been unsafe to drink. That's why tea became popular as you had to boil your water first before you could drink it. But if you ferment something and get just enough alcohol to kill all that bacteria, you're alive and buzzed, which is a great combination. And so for thousands of years, people have used beer, wine, cider, and in this area, it was called pulque. Uh, pulque is about a four to 6% alcohol that can be made from agave, it can be made from um, sotol, lots of different plants, kind of any of these succulent type plants that have a heart. Sotol is, uh, so you have Dacillaria and Wheelery, but around here you also have Dacillaria and Texanum. Um, it's a little bit bluer, you see it more in the hill country, so it's kind of up a little bit more here, as opposed to in San Antonio, we don't see it as much. But just like an agave, you can take it, you can roast it, but a lot of the early indigenous people learned very early on that you have to wait until right before it blooms because a plant in the desert is gonna be hoarding all these nutrients, all this water until the right opportunity. And then it uses all its energy, often dying right after to create that stock, to create the flower, to create the ovaries, the pollen, the nectar, it's a lot of work to bloom. And so early people realized that if you harvest it right before it's blooming, it's gonna have the biggest amount of nutrients. It's just like letting a cow fatten up before you, you eat it. And so they could roast the core and they have what are called quids. They found them in uh, the Rio Grande Valley. You have, just like an artichoke, you can take the leaf and they've, you can see teeth marks of people from hundreds and hundreds of years ago as they scraped with a little bit of meat off of the leaf. Once it's scraped, you can kind of dry it into a spoon shape and use it as a spoon, which is where it gets its name. Or you could take that heart, roast it, let it ferment, and then you get pulque. Now that was drunk for a few hundreds of years, thousands of years, until the Spanish came along and wreaked havoc. And what happened was they were drinking brandy as they were wreaking havoc. And when the brandy run out, ran out, that havoc just wasn't quite as fun anymore. So they could took this cool technique, uh, technology from Europe called distillation and they made agave. If you make it out of pulque that's made from the agave plant, you get tequila. If you make it from the dacillarian plant, you get a drink that's called sotol. Technically, it has to come from a certain region in Mexico, but right next to you guys, you have Dripping Springs, Desert Door Distillery. They're making Texas Sotol. Um, that is, they can call it that because they're using Texanum and it's Texas Sotol, it's not Sotol. So if you haven't tried it already, great way to try it, but also a fantastic landscape. Hey, if you're watching from home, can you mute? Uh, it was also heavily used for weaving, unlike an agave, which is very fleshy. This is very, very fibrous. So you can still see, you can go to the witty and you can see in this top left picture, the marks that the spines left. And you can still see that in baskets and footwear in the witty that are made from this plant. You can still see those impressions. Cruising along, I wanna make sure, take full advantage of your guys' time. So the last one I wanna talk about is the tasty. Now, this is my most basic introductory section. If I can't get you to, if you're like, nope, still hate ash juniper, it's like, why do I care about Yaupon Holly? This is where I can usually wrangle people. This is the most introductory. What can I eat right here, right now, without doing anything to it? And this is one of my favorite parts of a tour. If, if you can eat something, I'm usually gonna hand it to you and be like, here, try this. I learned very early on to always make sure and wear my badge so people know I work for the garden and I'm not just going around ripping up plants and being like, here, eat this. Uh, but people have kind of gotten used to me there being the, that, that person. So the first one I wanna talk about is Passiflora fetidae, the stinking passion flower. Now this is growing all over the garden right now. And me and the director of horticulture are constantly in a battle about 
ripping it out versus keeping it because I need it to teach with. Um, <laughs> luckily, no matter how much our team worked on it, I don't think they could ever get all the passion flower out of the garden. Nope. nope. Yep. It grows very fast. <laughs> so I always have something to teach with. I just kind of have to hunt down where they've left me a patch. This is not going to give you passion. It's not a stimulant. It was actually named after the early Spanish um, uh, missionaries that were coming in. They saw this really weird, unique flower and they saw the three organs and I was like, oh, those look like nails. And they saw the five other organs and like, those could be wounds. So you have three nails, one, two, three, you have five wounds, one, two, three, four, five. The fronds I've heard either represent the crown of thorns or the 72 silver pieces that Judas was paid. I don't have enough time in my life to count every single one of those. So I'm gonna go with the first one. But based off of all these, what they perceived as symbols, they believed that they were getting a blessing from God there to be settling down to build churches and to convert. And so they called it the passion flower after the passion of the Christ. It is actually a sedative. It is very, very good for helping you sleep. Um, I have one guide that will take a flower, put it in a mug at night. She'll pour some hot water over it. And then if she wakes up in the middle of the night, she'll drink it and it helps her get back to sleep. You can see this a lot in sleepy time teas. Um, it's just a very nice, subtle flavor. And you can use the leaves, you can use the flowers, pretty much all of it has that sedative effect. You just don't get a dramatic effect with the leaves it's, and some of the flowers. For the fruit, this is also a passion fruit. It is related to the passion fruit. The green unripe fruit um, are what gives it its regional name of, does anyone know this name? Maypop? Yeah, <laughs> uh, because of their very creative name where it's like a little balloon. If you step on it, it, it may pop. <laughs> However, when it turns red like this, you have, you can open it up and you get these black seeds surrounded by this white flesh. It is very refreshing. It's very light. It's kind of got a little bit of a lychee flavor. It's nowhere near as rich as a passion fruit that's been selectively bred for years and years for consumption. This is, it's just something you pop in your mouth and it's really tasty. I've always wanted to make like a water, like an aqua fresca with it, where I've just kind of mixed it around and gotten that little bit of that essence. But this is one of those fun ones to just, it's really refreshing, kind of like a little pomegranate or something like that. The next one I want to talk about is the Turk's cap or lazy hibiscus. And most of you have probably seen this one, but it's called that because it looks like a hibiscus that just didn't bother opening up in the morning. And I emphasize thoroughly with this plant. So it is in the mallow family. So I will give everyone a heads up. It is related to okra, but you can eat almost every single part of this plant. The young leaves can be used like a spinach alternative. Uh, they're a little bit fuzzy. So I like to chop them up. <laughs> Oh, I'm seeing faces. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not ideal. You're not going to make a full salad out of this one. This is kind of one of those cool, like, hey, you can eat this. And people go, oh, really? I have this in my yard. Um, but you can chop it up. You can dry stir fry it. You can roast it, things like that. If you just want to add a cool little element in. What I'm more, what I utilize more are those flowers. And they are beautiful, but they're also very tasty. They have a big pocket of nectar in them. And uh, that nectar is um, most prominent in the morning. It's, uh, they do it in order to attract uh, pollinators, just like this hummingbird. And it wanes throughout the day because they don't want to waste their energy making all this nectar when there's no pollinators out. So it's best early in the morning. And they don't have a lot of flavor, but they have that beautiful um, just nectar flesh. And so you can fry them into pancakes and a cocktail. But one of the most interesting things, and also the hardest to describe, is that okra-like slime, for lack of a better term. You can make a tea out of this. 
and or you can add it into your other teas. And just like a tea versus a stock or a broth, it adds, it doesn't make it slimy if you don't, if you don't pack it all in, but it gives just enough texture, just enough mouthfeel to make it a little bit more satisfying as opposed to just like a tea or a water. Um, it doesn't get slimy, but that's the best way I can describe it. <laughs> Lastly is the bottom left picture. And I call those apples because to me, they're just like a tiny little mini apple. They taste like them. They've got the texture of them. They're crisp. They've got big seeds in them. I love talking about these and getting people to eat them when they can. Although it's, they've been very prominent this year, but usually it's kind of a challenge because you pretty much have to fist fight a raccoon in order to get these early in the year because every critter in the garden, including um, Scott Lischke, our, our associate director, will eat these as soon as he sees them. So uh, you either have to fist fight Scott or fist fight um, a raccoon. And so, but if you do see them, they're very, very tasty and really fun to try. <laughs> yeah. They think it's tasty too. They like it a lot more than you do, I think. <laughs> yeah, so like this pink one here, I would pick that and then you can kind of pinch the green part and pinch the pink or the flower part and you just wiggle it and the green cat part will come off. And I just throw that over my shoulder because that's compostable. And then you can just pop it in your mouth. When it's, you want it when the stamen is out because that's when it's producing nectar. That can make it a little bit gritty. So if you don't like the texture of grit, I just pinch off that part with the pollen on it and you can just pop the whole thing in your mouth. And the flower itself, not a lot of flavor, but an interesting mouthfeel, but then just that burst of nectar, if you get a really good one, it's really cool. Thank you. I'm almost done, I promise. All right, the last one I want to talk about is the American Beauty Berry. And this one is really fun because as humans, as mammals, we see bright colors and we think, ooh, scary, don't eat, toxic, will die. Uh, so a lot of people, including some of our Hort team, actually thought this was incredibly poisonous, incredibly toxic. And it's not. It's really boring flavor. Um, <laughs> if you eat it straight off of the plant, it tastes like absolutely nothing. And a lot of times the birds won't even go for it. Some birds will, um, especially if they're desperate. But a lot of times, especially at the botanical garden where we have so many options, they'll save this one till the very last. It's kind of resentfully, they're like, okay, I guess we'll, we'll eat the beauty berry now. Um, but you can make a jam out of this one that is easily one of the best jams I've ever had. I made it last year and I'm going to do a class about it this year again, but it's kind of like a rose mixed berry. I've heard some people say it tastes like champagne. Um, it's really complex, really delicate. I, I, I did it and I used as little sugar, as little honey as possible with the low sugar pectin. And it's a very loose jelly because I didn't want to overwhelm the flavor, but it's everyone I had try it. I brought it to the botanical garden and people were just like, this is this plant. It's, it's really a fascinating, lovely, lovely taste that you can surprise people with. And lastly, I'm running out of time. So I'm gonna go through this one quickly, even though I have pretty much could do a thesis on this one at this point. <laughs> But this is chiltepine, chili piquin, piquino pepper, turkey pepper, cayenne pepper, bird pepper. As an ethnobotanist, if something has a lot of names, you usually know it's interesting because a lot of people have decided to name it. This originated in the chiltepine in particular, originated in Bolivia about 6 million years ago. And birds love this plant. They can't taste capsaicin because as mammals, we chew and we grind. And so when we chew and grind, 
seeds get destroyed and when we poop them out, they're absolutely useless. Birds don't do that. And so birds are directly responsible for eating these chili peppers, flying all the way up through Central America and even into Texas, pooping all along the way. And they brought this plant with them. However, one of the interesting things is they're finding in paleo feces that early indigenous people here didn't use it. They've really only found mint plants in uh, feces here. It's really with Central America where it's really, really humid uh, that they really adapted a taste for it because it's great for purging out all those gut pathogens that might kill you. So they selectively bred it. We started to get slightly bigger ones like the chili pekin, and they used, made bigger ones, different colors, flavors. And then Christopher Columbus shows up and he brings the seeds back to Europe with him. And it goes nuts. People love it so much. It's, uh, it grows really easily. So it actually became known as the peasant spice because anyone could grow it, anyone could use it. And so it spread all over incredibly quickly so fast, in fact, that they thought for a long time that it originated in India and uh, Southeast Asia. But as it's spreading, 200 years after Christopher Columbus came, you have the Spanish missionaries who have a well-developed taste for chili now. They're coming up through Central America into Texas with a taste for chili pepper and lots of meat. And that's when the chili started becoming incorporated into the diet here in Texas. You also have the chili peppers spreading throughout the Ottoman Empire around the Mediterranean. And of course, Europe has birds too. And birds did what birds do best. They ate the chili peppers. They flew through Africa, pooping all along the way. And peppers were able to get naturalized there as well. And then when you have these Central Africans getting enslaved and brought to the United States and working in the kitchens of their owners, they're incorporating chili pepper into their diets as well. So as an ethnobotanist, I like to end with this one because this is the kind of plant that makes my head explode. But this native plant had to leave twice and come back in order to start being utilized. Now I could, I could, there's like a hundred million different things that I'm trying not to say about chili pepper too, because I could keep going on for a long time with this one, but I'm pretty much out of time. So I want to make sure there's time for any questions that people have. And I also want to, I'm sorry, the thing is covering it up, um, but I've got cards back there. Me and my team created a native plant virtual exhibit um, that if this interests you, you should definitely check it out. We picked five native plants and we explored how they've been preserved throughout history and um, using like herbaria specimens, paintings, uh, photographs, anything like that. And um, that's what the exhibit's about. So if this interests you, definitely check it out. I've got cards back there about the exhibit and I'm happy to answer any questions people may have. Yeah, so our, our website is not the easiest to navigate. Um, so if you go to mavefacet.com on my first page, I actually have my calendar and I put all my programs on there and September through December were just posted. Uh, so I might not have been able to upload them yet, but if you are just interested in me, that's the easiest way to find them. You can also go to our website and just type in Mave. And good thing about a unique name is I'm the only one that pops up. <laughs> so all my classes will pop up that way too. Um, and cookbook maybe eventually. <laughs> I've got a lot on my plate right now. I have been planning to like make a point in my website where I just upload interesting recipes like that, but oh, I've been told that before too. <laughs> it's stressing me out here. <laughs> yeah. Spanish when they brought cattle north, 
because they were going to the water source or the grass that was growing under the trees and brought the seeds with the cattle coming north. So I've absolutely heard that too. Um, what I have most recently researched was that like the ash juniper, it wasn't as prevalent as it is now. So it was in this area and it is technically a native, but it grew only kind of along water sources. It's once the cattle industry came to Texas that it really spread beyond water sources and throughout the rest of the state. And so it's kind of one of those things where it wasn't really recorded as much and we don't have photographs, we don't have written records as much. I've gone through so many archives and people were so bad at writing down what plants they saw, They're really good at writing down what they ate for dinner, um, <laughs> but not what plants they saw, even uh, Lindheimer and things like that. So um, it was, as far as I've seen, the most recent research is that it was in this area. It just wasn't anywhere near as prevalent as it is now. And it has become invasive in Asia and Africa, honey mesquite in particular. Yes. This is more of a comment. Sure. I brought devil's Yes. And it showed up in my yard. Oh, yeah. But I did some research on it, and it says that the indigenous people would eat it as okra. So I brought a green part. Hey, Hayden, could you grab that for me so I could show the people on camera? Do you mind? Does anybody want the table? It smells kind of a neat plant. Yeah. And it's the butterflies love them. So devil's claw is one of the plants in my exhibit. Thank you. I'm attached to the microphone, so I don't want to take it out with me. Yeah, so these are the young pods of the devil's claw. And so when they're, this is a little too old, but when they're younger, you can eat them like an okra. Uh, it's nice and soft. It's, they're pretty fibrous. They're, it's kind of one of those things, like if you're desperate or curious, then maybe. But what happens is when they dry, they'll actually split like this. Um, and these co-evolved with the giant mastodons and giant sloths, because what they'll do is they'll hook on to uh, fur or, um, whatever is passing by, and then as they walk, they'll drop their seeds like this. Uh, but yeah, you can eat that, and then because of this beautiful black color, these are heavily used. So they don't actually think they used to look like this. These are actually um, partially selectively bred for because they were so heavily used by a lot of indigenous people for weaving this beautiful black color. Anytime you see a basket with black is usually this. And so they were selectively breeding them for longer prongs. Uh, so um, especially in Arizona, so these may be a little bit more accurate, but you can get ones that are just like this big because they've been so selectively bred for. But this is honestly one of my favorite plants too. It's so cool. <laughs> it's so dramatic. Yeah, really pretty flower, kind of a boring plant, but once you see these, it's like, it, compared to some Texas native plants, it's kind of a boring looking plant. Yeah, 5,000 native plants. Oh, that's a pretty big relative. <laughs> I'll fight you on this. <laughs> Any other questions? No? Well, I do have lots of classes coming up. I'm doing an ethnobotany of mesquite. Um, I'm doing one all about uh, Chiltepin and the Chili Queens, the history of Tex-Mex. Um, I'm doing an American Beauty Berry. And then every single month, usually about the third Wednesday of the month, I do an ethnobotany of native plants tour throughout the garden. Um, and if there is something that you can eat, I will offer it to you. So. Uh, yeah, anything you see at the garden involving ethnobotany, I'm usually involved in it. So, yeah, thank you all. Thank you for inviting me. Oops, stuck. There you go. <laughs> I just want to say thank you. We had uh, 40, 40 something people at one point on Zoom. But I also apologize to the people on Zoom. I do not know why we have the issue with the screen, but we'll explore that and try to avoid having that in the future. Um, the, and I was going to mention.